This is a very difficult question for 2CK Pediatrics. If you are studying for step one and want a high score, this is worth knowing because there is a degree of overlap between the USMLE exams. This question I created very similar to one on Pediatrics Form 5. Very weird, very factoidy question. Every fucking student says, what the fuck, when they see this question, all right? That's why I'm here. We're going to discuss some factoidy things in addition to the baseline of high-yield info you otherwise need to know. So before we get started, why don't you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, hit the like button, really appreciate it. Let's get this to all-time highs. Hit the bell if you want notifications, and find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Now, let's start the question. So we have a newborn who's ultra post-term, 43 weeks gestation, our typical timing of parturition being 40 weeks. APGAR scores at one in five minutes or two and four respectively. APGAR, appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, respirations. And the score at one minute reflects conditions at birth. At five minutes reflects responsiveness to resuscitation. I'm not going to spend time going through uh, APGAR scores. You can Google that easily and we want to stay concise here. There's potential meconium aspiration because of the staining of the newborn's nails and skin, meconium just being the first passage of stool. Blood gas analysis shows acidosis, pH 7.08, normal range 7.35 to 45. PCO2, normal range is 33 to 44, so we can see at 33 low that this is clearly not a respiratory acidosis. We'd have a metabolic acidosis. PO2, 30 millimeters of mercury, that's low. You don't have to worry about the exact values. Anyone not a neonate should be as close to 100 millimeters mercury as possible. Neonates, it can be lower, 60, 70. The point is it's low here. In settings of hypoxia, we can get lactic acidosis leading to metabolic acidosis because if we don't have oxygenation of our tissues adequately, then we can get resultant anaerobic respiration with lactic acidosis. So we keep reading, transthoracic echo shows normal cardiac anatomy with a right to left shunt across the foramen ovale. Immediately that sounds weird because you say, wait, this kid's already born. So why is there fetal circulation present with a right to left shunt across the foramen ovale? That's what we expect when the kid is in utero, but he's already born. I don't get it. That's weird, right? So we have our question that just asks, uh, what's the most likely explanation for these findings? So let's just go through our answers sequentially. Choice A, closure of ductus arteriosus. This is the wrong answer. This is going to be the answer on the USMLE for preductal coarctation. The vignette will tell you that you have a neonate who is normal at birth. They will say, i.e., APGAR scores are eight and nine at one and five minutes, respectively. And then a week later, the kid is hypoxic, and that's because of the closure of the ductus arteriosus over the first week of life. I have seen questions between three days and 10 days when the kid becomes hypoxic, but textbook, classically the kid's normal at birth, and then a week later becomes hypoxic. In, in cases of severe preductal coarctation, there's a reliance on a residual right-to-left flow ac across that ductus arteriosus to maintain oxygenation, okay? So we look at choice B, Decreased pulmonary vascular resistance is the wrong answer. This will be the answer on the USMLE for a severe ventricular septal defect. The vignette will tell you that you have a kid who does not have a murmur at birth, and then a week later has a systolic murmur. And they ask why there's a systolic murmur appearing now in the setting of a VSD, answer, decreased pulmonary vascular resistance. At birth, in utero as well, but at birth, we still have high pulmonary vascular resistance in place from the fetal circulation. And that means that with the VSD present, there's a very attenuated, a very weak left to right shunt across that VSD. So in terms of a pressure gradient, and then over the first week of life, as the pulmonary vasculature opens up, there's a gradual decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance, which means decreased right-sided heart pressure, enabling a more augmented left-to-right gradient from high to low across that VSD. And now we get the murmur, okay? So once again, if they ask you why you have a murmur a week later, 
Answer, decreased pulmonary vascular resistance. We have a VSD. The shunt is now audible from the gradient. If they ask you why you do not, why you did not hear the murmur at birth, the answer, conversely, increased pulmonary vascular resistance initially. Okay. We keep reading. Failure of pulmonary vasodilation, choice C. This is the correct answer. Okay. This diagnosis is called persistent pulmonary hypertension or persistent fetal circulation. Okay. Now I say this is factoidy because this is weird. You say, wait, really? I've never heard of that before. Okay. That's why we're discussing this. So there is a diagnosis you need to know for peds. And granted, if you want to get a 270 on step one and it happens to show up, there's a diagnosis where you will get a vignette of a post-term birth. That's a risk factor. Post-term birth. In addition, meconium aspiration. Okay. These are risk factors for the fetal vasculature not opening up appropriately after parturition. Okay. So there's other, there's lots of risk factors in the literature, but what the USMLE does is they are going to give you a vignette of a 42, 43 week uh, gestation neonate. You say, wow, that's like really post term. And plus or minus the meconium aspiration. And then they're going to give you some sort of descriptor as far as there's fetal circulation persistent here, okay, as we have the right to left shunt across the Formino Valley. And the answer is persistent fetal circulation or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And our answer is just failure of pulmonary vasodilation, okay? Choices D and E uh, are just distractors, increases on vascular resistance, intracardiac left to right shunt, okay, just distractors. Now, there's, a, there's many lines of discussion I can go on. I want to keep this clip concise. I will just give you a final piece of value to be aware of another condition called transient tachypnea of the newborn, which lots of students fuck up. The vignette is going to sound like NRDS, neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, okay? It's going to sound like NRDS, but you're going to notice in the vignette that the kid's not preterm, okay? So in NRDS, classically the kid's born before 34 weeks gestation, you'll get a vignette where they'll say kid's born at term 38 weeks gestation, sounds like NRDS with pulmonary infiltrates. And they'll tell you the kid was born via Caesar or fast vaginal delivery. And that's due to inadequate time, insufficient time for pulmonary lymphatics to clear fluid out of the newborn's lungs. Okay, that's called transient tachypnea of the newborn. They might tell you chest x-ray shows fluid within fissure lines. Students choose NRDS, wrong fucking answer, transient tachypnea of the newborn. Not related to this question, but it's just an extra uh, layer of value because there's many avenues we can go down, but I want to keep this concise enough. So you know the deal. I'm obviously going to make more questions. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel, and I appreciate your time. That's it.